Thank you, Carlin. Oh, oh God, okay. So um, as quick background, um, the or what, I guess I'll go into the background in a second, but um, the plan for today is to talk about the, the four specific um, uh, possibilities for providing shelter in our building and on the grounds um, that we have researched, that the Vestry has researched so far this year. Um, so this is not um, an announcement of what we're doing. This is, you know, we're not voting. Um, we are just talking about the things that, that we've looked into um, with the city and with providers. Um, and so uh, we want to get, um, you know, folks perspective on the option so far, and especially if you have other ideas. Um, I'm also gonna be sending out um, a link to a survey at the end. So that'll be where you let me know um, what you're most interested in, other concerns or questions you have, and uh, what you think you could commit to. So moving on. Um, so just a quick word about words. Um, I don't think you can see this, but these women are comparing carrots. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of like, you know, jargony stuff in these kinds of conversations. And um, some folks say houseless, some folks say homeless. Um, in my own experience, um, I, I know a lot of unhoused folks and they refer to themselves in different ways. Um, so what I think is most important in this conversation is that you know, however we speak about other people, we mean neighbor. And um, I also say that like, we certainly, we have, uh, we're not, this is not an us and them. We have unhoused folks in the congregation. And um, so this is, we're all uh, one community. So, and all of our options are oriented around um, this working in community. So share your carrots. So quick plan, I'll just, I'm not, I'll go through this really quickly. Um, so this is just noting that um, I'm gonna share kind of the background, talk a little bit about St. David's and our like how our conversations have gone so far. And then I'm gonna go into each one of the major four options. And then we will go into Q and A. So I'm hoping that we can have a good long chunk of time for discussion and we can wrap up um, at noon. Okay. All right, so the timeline kind of that I, that is relevant to this, um, there's sort of, this is really the 2021 timeline. Um, so there's been a, many, many conversations over the decades at St. David's about um, reaching out to the houseless population and there's been plenty of different efforts. I don't know everything about all of those efforts, but I have gotten um, feedback, intel from folks of, about um, previous things that we've done. I know we've provided shelter in the building before and um, folks have feelings about how that went. Um, I also don't know a ton about, about those things because I just came onto the vestry this year. Um, but obviously up until this point, we have tons of passion for justice in the congregation and um, lots of attempts to do this. So February 2021, this is kind of when the vestries shelter conversations really started uh, with the ice storm. Um, that's kind of what launched this round of, of conversation. Um, and we also created the social justice fund um, in the vestry of, of 20 grand. Um, <laughs> the next big chunk of the year, basically up until now, um, we've been information gathering, we've been going through the um, the permit process for getting shelter. Um, we don't have one yet because the timing of that matters, but we know what we need to do to finish that process. Um, we formed a shelter subcommittee with uh, myself, Vance and Ryan. Um, we have been going through uh, building renovations. Obviously the kitchen is being remodeled, um, very exciting. And the electricity is being remodeled. Um, and we've been um, working on the guest room in the basement. That's been happening. I'm not gonna go into the hygiene for all stuff because I don't, I don't think we have time. Um, and then today, like I said, we're just gonna talk about different possibilities that- Ross, it looks like they're starting. Okay. Um, 
Can we, Carlin, would it be possible to mute everybody? So we're. Yeah, as people come in, um, I am remuting folks, so. Oh, okay. Totally fine. I just, I know that I often leave myself not muted and then everyone hears everything. <laughs> um, so we're gonna talk today about like what we're most interested in and questions, concerns, ideas. And then after this, there's not um, a totally structured clear path after this, except that I'm, we're gonna be reading the surveys and see what generated um, the most passion in the congregation. And then we're gonna figure out what that looks like going forward. So, okay. Um, so just a note about why, like why St. David's, um, I think, a big one is our building. We have a large building um, with a lot of discrete rooms. Um, we have a large grounds um, and we have a history of, you know, providing space for the community um, in this building. And we are renovating the building and working on raising a lot of money uh, towards uh, making it everything we want it to be. Uh, we are centrally located, so we actually are physically close to um, a lot of folks who live um, outside in Southeast. Um, so we are uh, relatively accessible to a lot of folks who could access us. And then last point, obviously we have the best people around, um, in my opinion. Um, and. Uh, I put the flag there because something that I think gets lost in these discussions sometimes is that a lot of the, um, a lot of the programs that that serve that provide shelter to um, houseless folks often are in more conservative churches, and extremely grateful to them for that work and that outreach. And I think it's it's something special that this is a an LGBTQ affirming church and committed to racial justice, um, I think that that's a form of hospitality that is really vital that we offer. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so our priorities, the subcommittee's priorities um, in talking about shelter and what we think is most important, um, right? We wanna do our part. So we can't do everything. Um, there's a ton of different interests in the congregation and Obviously, we're just one set of people, um, but we want to do what we can do and be able to say that we did our best to, um, to be good neighbors. And also, we want to create something that is well organized and sustainable. So we want to do it right, basically. That's why we've been doing our homework and talking to people, making plans, scratching plans, um, and uh, you know, talking to neighbors and building uh, partners and other folks because we want to we want to build something that will last. And it's not going to be perfect because it's run by people, um, but we want to you know do our best to do it right. And then the other thing is that the feedback that I got from definitely folks with the county <laughs> is that this really really these programs really work best with the whole neighborhood. Um, bought in. So people who are happy with what's going on and folks who want to help. So obviously the congregation is going to provide a lot of support to whatever we do, but engaging in the neighborhood is really um, important to us. So I'm really, really glad that there are neighbors here um, beyond the congregation. Um, I'm really uh, pleased and excited that neighbors are interested in these programs and want to help make them work. Okay, so I'm going to go through the four things. Um, option number one is, um, and these are in terms of order, I mean, they're just, there's more or less like in order of, well, there's actually no, now that I think about it, there's no logical order. So don't read anything into that. <laughs> um, number one is quarterly family shelter with a program called Family Promise. Um, so these, these slides look a little different because I took them from from their PowerPoint. Um, so uh, Family Promises, I don't need to read all of this, but basically their mission is to help families um, exit um, homelessness and into go into permanent housing. Um, it is a, a national organization. So there are basically they're, they're like local networks all connected across the country. 
um, and the local networks provide the program. So, um, and there are, there are already six different um, networks in this region and um, hundreds nationwide. Um, basically the way it works is um, families enter the program, they wanna find permanent housing and they define families as basically their kids in the unit. So it can be two parents and kids, one parent and kids, grandparents, as long as they're like children and an adult, <laughs> um, that's, their, that's who can participate. Um, in the program, basically the way it works, they go, everyone goes to the same day center every day. So they have that stability. They can receive services, kids do their homework, kids get a bus to their school that they were already going to. So they don't have to switch schools. They have showers, food, um, et cetera. Um, so they go to the same place every day. And then at night, they go to um, a different church one week at a time. And so there are host churches that host um, a set of families for one week at a time, basically each quarter. Um, and then there are also support congregations that provide, you know, that don't host families, but that provide volunteers, like a significant number of the volunteers and, um, and stuff like that. So typically the, a host church would take about five families, um, which they estimate to be about 14 or 15 people at a time. Um, and uh, we would supply um, about the, you said best case scenario, one third of the volunteers in a given week, worst case scenario, um, half of the volunteers. Um, and that, that you're looking at um, about, about 50 shifts. So in a, in a week. So that's like morning shift where you make breakfast and you pack lunches. For, for kids before they leave at 8 a.m. for the day center. And then there's like basically an evening shift. Uh, the, everyone comes back up to the church at five o'clock and make dinner. If folks are, have this skill set and are available, you can do activities with the kids, show movies, whatever in the evenings. And then um, there's an overnight shift. So one of the, the kind of fun but challenging things about uh, Family Promise is that um, legally, and I think this is wise, um, you have to have at least two people stay in the church overnight with the families. Um, so that is a very, very important uh, shift. Um, and uh, obviously, like I say, I'm saying it shifts because one person can do multiple things in a day or in a week. Um, but if you think about it in terms of like tasks, that's like 50 separate tasks that we would need folks to sign up for. So that means about 15 to 25 um, different tasks that we would need um, St. David's community and our neighbors um, to, uh, to provide in a week. So it's a pretty big, um, it's a pretty big time and commitment in like short bursts. Um, so I guess a little bit about Family Promise of Metro East. So they're just getting started. So they have been recruiting us hard this year because they really, really like our space. Um, and uh, they think, you know, we're in a great location and the guest room that we've been developing as well as a couple of the other rooms uh, that are not used at night um, could be really good to create a particularly hospitable um, environment for families. And sometimes churches just have folks post up in the sanctuary in tents. Um, and we don't want, we don't, you know, if we're gonna offer this, we want uh, folks to be comfortable and feel like they're safe and at home, which is partly why we've been developing the guest room. Um, so there are several committed host organizations already, and they would really like us to be another host organization because they're just getting this off, uh, off the ground in Portland. And, and their goal, sorry, their goal is to start basically late 2021. So that doesn't mean necessarily that we host in late 2021, but that's when they're hoping to, to start hosting families. Um, I don't need to go into all of this, but basically it's Sunday to Sunday. So families arrive uh, Sunday evening, they eat dinner, they kind of chill in, in, the, in the church, um, and then they go to bed, two people stay overnight, 
Uh, there's someone on call at the day center all the time. And uh, in the morning, they get up early, they eat breakfast, they take their sack lunches that we make, and they go to the day center or the school if, if they're in school that day. And then they come back at night. And then um, they do that, like I said, for a week and they leave uh, the following Sunday morning. So sometimes they stay for church in the morning if that's being offered in person. Um, sometimes they don't, but that's kind of how that works. Um, oh, okay, this is set up with transitions. Uh, I think I basically covered this. I think I covered everything. Okay. Oh yeah. I guess for transportation sake, the day center and support congregations provide that transportation. So we're just, what we do is just at the church. Okay. So this is a very successful program. Um, most families come in for two months. Sometimes they stay for three months, um, but the vast majority, about 80% exit to permanent housing, um, which is a very good lift. So the what I think is so great about the program is that, you know, we're not just sheltering people for a little bit so that they're out of the elements, like we're participating in a program that actually gets a lot of families and a lot of children um, into permanent housing every year. So the 45, <laughs> I said like in typical years, St. David's might have 45 people. I did that because 14 times four times 80% is about 45, um, which is a lot of people. And that's mostly kids. And so what we would be doing, like I said, four weeks out of the year, so about one week, uh, a quarter. And uh, the program would use our parish hall, the kitchen, the guest room downstairs, and then at least two other rooms. And what we've looked at is the godly playroom and uh, the youth group room, because they're kind of big and they can be sort of partitioned into two separate rooms. The guest room itself is kind of, is basically two rooms. Um, so we wanted each family to have, you know, a discrete space where they feel safe. Um, like I said, about 15 to 25 volunteer shifts each week. And um, we would really need to make this work. We would really need like a solid group of people who are committed to volunteering. Um, a smaller group of people who I think are committed to volunteering at least twice a week, and then a, maybe a bigger group that are committed to once a week. Um, but we need folks definitely to show up. So um, right, advantages, big impact, like I said, it's only you know, short bursts of a lot of, of activity, quarterly time commitment. Um, we have the support of this really large successful organization and these other churches in the network um, and then um, when I say easier population, I mean, um, folks are uh, obviously become concerned when they learn uh, that there might be homeless services in the neighborhood. And sometimes uh, it's easier for churches to um, get community support through this program because it is um, parents and children. And uh, there is a vetting process that they have to go through. So, um, so it's, uh, they, they make sure to screen out folks who are obviously like active drug users or have um, other really serious challenges that, that the program doesn't feel equipped to deal with. And um, see the biggest challenge is just that we need, uh, before we committed, we would need to make sure that we had a solid group of people, I would say at least 10 people who are really committed uh, to making this work. And we already have, you know, we have the shelter committee, we have the Felders who, are interested, um, Jeannie. Uh, so we're, 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 you know, we're a good way there, but we definitely need more people who um, know that they can connect. Okay. So, and just for the record, I'm, um, you know, I'm conveying information. I'm just my, you know, myself representing the vestry. Um, personally speaking, I'm in favor of all of these options. I think they can all be made to work. Um, and some of them, raise different feelings than others. And uh, I just wanna give every program kind of its due, if that makes sense. Um, okay, the second one we learned about relatively recently. Um, I think it's really exciting. Um, basically I talked to the county 
about their emergency weather programs. What would it look like to have a winter shelter? What would it look like to have a smoke shelter or a cooling center? And they basically said like, hey, you're not big enough for us to invest um, our, our kind of dollars, <laughs> our big dollars. Um, but there is, a, there is a program that is basically the county, um, is like a joint thing with the county and the community um, called um, Neighbors Organizing, or no, I'm sorry, Communities Organizing Around Disasters, which is a national organization. And um, the county is, is trying to really heavily support that getting going in Portland. Basically, it's a model um, in which you know, there are community organizations in different parts of the city that do like neighborhood wide type services. So they would do like an emergency shelter that is designed to serve the folks in the neighborhood. So instead of like 200 people in a building, it might be 20 people or 40 people or whatever the capacity of that organization is. So sorry, I got ahead of myself. Yeah. So if we were to do this, we would be basically like a neighborhood emergency hub. So the county and COAD, which is how you pronounce the acronym, um, COAD would help us do outreach to, um, to folks in the neighborhood who might need emergency services um, in, a, in like a weather emergency. Um, and folks would know about us and we would be kind of helpers in our neighborhood. Um, so, they're really enthusiastic about us potentially um, being used as a cooling center. Um, and they said also smoke and winter weather could, could work if we had like 20 people. Um, the way it works is they try to project three days in advance when there's gonna be a disaster. Um, usually you can do that with weather. Um, so the way it would work is like three days before they think a storm is coming uh, at least three days. The county would activate and it would get in touch with the co-ed hubs and uh, the county would provide all of our supplies that we would need. Um, they would help get the bulk of the volunteers. They would provide trained volunteers, like people who've been trained in like the 40 hour like neighborhood emergency team um, program to help. And um, they, you know, food, water, like, mainly we would be providing space and then we could also provide volunteers um, however many we wanted to provide um, to help either in the daytime or at night uh, depending on what we were doing. Um, so I think in that case we would need a group of people who are ready to be activated in, um, in the course of an emergency um, and so yeah so require like having a coordinating team uh, that can communicate with the county and with our building partners. Um, obviously, like if we were doing a nighttime thing, building partners typically aren't there, um, but a cooling center would be during the day. So it would require like coordinating like with the preschool at 115 degrees, um, the preschool closed. <laughs> so there probably wouldn't be a lot of intersection with uh, building partners and something like this, but we do need to be able to coordinate. Um, and um, I guess vigilance around maintaining the grounds, meaning like, you know, we wanna make sure that folks are accessing us within the building and that and there aren't people like sleeping out in the parking lot or on the grounds because building partners, especially like Jennifer who runs the preschool are often the people who end up encountering those folks and, um, and needing to ask them to leave. So we would need to make sure that we were being really good stewards of the space. Um, also, big thing, if we're going to do a cooling center, we need air conditioning, which we don't have. <laughs> so that would be a big investment um, on the part of the church, um, something we've been talking about. Um, so that's, but that is a consideration that in order to do something like that, we would need um, to update our ventilation and have a cooling system. Um, we have the heat going, so that's nice. We can do that in the wintertime without major, major upgrades. And advantages of this, um, you know, we get to be the helpers um, in our neighborhood, which um, I know during the ice storm, I felt really helpless and devastated that I didn't 
have the as many skills as I wanted to have or the resources I needed to have to help. Um, and uh, you know, this thing really works in groups, and there are a lot of groups in town that did a good job of um, helping folks respond to the ice storm and to the smoke and to the heat. Um, and I would love to be a group like that as well. Um, and also work with those groups and learn from them. Um, great thing is that basically the county provides the supplies and a lot of the volunteers. So it wouldn't be a huge financial commitment unless, you know, the exception of like air conditioning. <laughs> um, also, it's only an emergency. So this isn't um, a year round thing. And um, another thing is that our guest room would be a um, special contribution to this program because, um, you know, they don't usually have a space within these shelters where a family could go or somebody who cannot handle being in a big room with a bunch of people could go, somebody with a dog or a cat. <laughs> um, it's special to be able to have that smaller space. Um, so that's cool. The biggest challenge, I mean, having a group that can coordinate with the county. And okay, I realize we're at 11.30, so I'm gonna try and make sure that we have a good chunk of time for, for Q&A. Okay, so this option is something that um, we've been talking about uh, since, since the beginning, since the ice storm, um, because I, you know, I observed mutual aid groups doing a really good job of like just going out and getting people into motel rooms. And um, I spoke with someone from Defense PDX who I've observed as being the major player of doing that um, and asked like, you know, would it be nice to just have a church that like, if you found somebody who needed shelter, like they could go there. Um, like, is that something people want? And they said emphatically, yes, it would be huge to be able to say, you know, we have a church with a room. Let's see uh, if we can put you there for a night or two nights. Um, so uh, what that would look like is like, you know, we would have the shelter committee would have communication with a mutual aid group like Defense PDX or an established organization like Beacon or something like that, um, who could, you know, reach out to us if they had someone who just needed to stay there for a night or two. Um, we would establish rules around who could stay. Um, and we would need people on hand who were willing to stay overnight. Defense PDX, um, which I think is a very effective mutual aid group, emphasized to me that they, like, they have a lot of volunteers, they have people who would stay overnight. Um, so kind of depends on where you get the, the, the guests from. Um, and then, of course, like, we would need to make sure that, like, the guests leave in the morning before the preschool. We make sure that, like, everything's cleaned up and we wash the bedding and everything. Um, and if, you know, they're not staying there during the day, it would need to be, it would need to be nighttime. Um, and uh, you know, we can provide food if, if we have the capacity for that. Um, so this requires like more than just one person <laughs> who can coordinate, who can be available to coordinate uh, guests and volunteers. Um, we would need to have really, really good communication with building partners um, so that, you know, everyone knows, you know, no one's surprised by the fact that someone's like sleeping in the guest room um, or slept in the guest room the night before, you know, we'd want to make sure that we're making this work for everybody. Um, ideally, we'd have people who were trained in de-escalation or in first aid or in like Narcan delivery. Um, a lot of the mutual aid folks are trained in that. Um, uh, and then also just very good boundaries. Right? This is probably the biggest concern that pops up around uh, this option is like, what if somebody comes and they don't wanna leave? Um, what if they wanna stay for a lot of nights? And we just need to, we, in order to make this work, we would need to establish like very clear rules and be um, very big picture about it. Like, you know, if this is going to work for anyone, it needs to go this way. Uh, advantages, highly flexible, right? Um, good use of the room that, that we are renovating, I think. Um, and if we're working with other organizations, like they can help us with labor. Um, biggest challenge, I think, is maintaining those boundaries. 
in. So this is um, an option that definitely um, inspires a lot of passion. Um, it's something that a lot of folks in the congregation have asked about or brought up as we've talked about this. Um, and it's something that we're seeing pop up in the city. Um, for example, uh, Beacon um, is building a tiny home village in, on the grounds of UCC Bridgeport. Um, and then there's also several other tiny home villages that have appeared in town. Um, they work in different ways. So folks have basically brought up the idea of like, what if we could have tiny homes on the grounds? So I had a long conversation with um, the person who cites tiny homes for the county. Um, the way this would work is um, we would partner with a community organization that knows how to do this. So like at UCC Bridgeport, right? Beacon, which is a longtime service provider, is running the village um, and providing services and providing basically, you know, hygiene and everything that folks need. Um, and it would be funded by the county. And because it's funded by the county, it would need to be, um, it couldn't be just a couple tiny homes. Um, they really want to fund like villages of like eight to 10 plus um, homes um, because they work in as communities. So they, you know, like the folks who live there, like come up with rules and are self-governing and run a lot of the, the services. Um, and so, and like, you also have like social worker on staff who helps folks find permanent housing. You have to pay for like a shower and bathroom trailer. So there's like startup costs and they would just, you know, the county wants to invest in um, something of a certain scale. So um, if this were to exist, uh, it would be tiny homes or pallet shelters, not tents. Um, and uh, there would be, like I said, hygiene facilities within the village. So showers, bathrooms, ideally they have their own kitchen and then their own common area um, for meetings. It would be completely fenced in uh, with their own round the clock security. Um, and ideally the way that this works best, I mean, is if the congregation, you know, like the congregation in the neighborhood um, have a good relationship to the village. So the, as the congregation, like we can decide how much we actually wanna be involved um, cause you don't have to provide labor or supplies or access to the building, um, but you can, if you want. Um, obviously like this is an influx of people. So we would want to make sure that, that we had good relationships with the neighbors and the county often will, will facilitate that process. Um, and they wanted me to point out that uh, the St. John's village um, abuts a preschool. So they wanted to emphasize that like they have the ability to facilitate those kind of conversations if people are willing. And so <laughs> the way that this would work, the biggest challenge here is uh, where it would go. And Basically, they said either you could give up the parking lot, I'm sorry, you could donate the parking lot um, to this, or you could donate uh, the grounds of, of the church. Um, and it would be, it would be a significant um, amount of, of grounds. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but like, this is a church, <laughs> this is our church as seen by a drone, um, the parking lot, right? So it would either go here or it would go in the front yard or on the side, um, kind of next to the East, East Garden. Um, and I think that they would use the East Garden as well. So it would be a significant donation of space um, if we were to do this. Um, and it would be a commitment to host for several years. <laughs> it's a lot of work to put all that stuff up. So it would need to, we would need to commit to making it, making it work. Okay, and we're at 1140, so. Um, advantages. Uh, it, these villages have a really big impact for guests. It's very meaningful for people to have a space that's obviously out of the elements, but also where they can lock their stuff. Um, it provides really valuable community support. Um, we would have control over 
you know, what kind of folks are allowed in, what kind of rules that they would need to follow, um, and, you know, whether we wanted to serve a specific population, um, although we don't have to provide volunteers or even a lot of money. It's mainly um, a commitment to share space. Biggest challenge, obviously, the space. And um, I think to make it work, we'd have to have a lot of community conversations about, um, about all of the aspects of this. Okay. All right. So um, uh, I see there's Carolyn uh, offered to help with questions in the chat. And then um, uh, I guess, Carolyn, how do we want to do? Thank you so much, Cass. Um, yeah, I think at this point, if um, we want to sort of um, open it up and if people have questions, if you could put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and if Cass, you want to stop sharing your screen so that we can sort of see <laughs> more folks again. Okay. Um, so yes, so at this point for people who have questions, Let's see, Shaquita, you have a question. Yeah, um, and I, I kind of wrote down quick, real fast. So um, I guess my main one is, um, have people actually visited um, current homeless shelters um, during um, the time that they're inhabited, that people are there? And not just the what the officials are saying, because I've gone to these shelters before and what people say is happening is not what's happening sometimes. Um, I've delivered people that I found on the street. I had a male and his two little girls and I couldn't find a place that was safe enough for them. So me and my friend ended up uh, renting a hotel for them because it was just not safe for him and his kids. And so I just, that's one of the things is just have people actually gone when these places are actually happening and actually talk to homeless people, why they don't go to shelters. And I've done that before too. And a lot of them say security and safety is the main issue. Yeah, thank you, Shakrita. Uh, I mean, speaking for myself, uh, yes, I have I have volunteered at um, emergency shelters and had conversations with folks about um, kind of the pluses and minuses of shelters. Um, we also talked about um, definitely in the process of figuring this out that we would um, do specific outreach to the folks living outside in the neighborhood and make sure that. Uh, that however we designed it, it would be meeting their needs. I mean, obviously, like, <laughs> they haven't, like, not, con like, not talked to them this entire time, um, but uh, mainly we've been interfacing with providers and actually talking to folks who might stay with us is, is going to be a big priority going forward, if that answers your question. Yeah, I, I think my thing is just um, actually getting information, Sometimes we want to help people the way we want to help them mm -hmm. and not the way they want to be helped or what they, they think are their needs. And so you end up doing a lot of work on things that are not going to actually be accepted by the people you want to help. So that's what I'm saying. So. Excellent point. Yeah. Franz. Hi. Um, I guess first, I think it's great that uh, you guys are bringing this up and we're all here to kind of think about this, um, housing is clearly a huge issue in Portland right now. Um, and I really like hearing that, you know, one of the, the kind of the tenets for you guys getting into this is being really well organized and sustainable. Um, I know that a decade or so ago, um, the daybreak shelter used to operate out of the church for, um, but it seemed very similar to the family promise idea. It was like a week a year, um, they were kind very of related. Yeah. Yeah. It very is. related. Similar deal. Yeah. And it was, it was very smooth. I mean, you would, um, people came in and out and everyone's very respectful and it didn't, it, it, I think it was a great way to give back. And, you know, I think what works really well is, is that built in presence and, and knowing that, you know, just as you say with the family promise, there has to be two people there. Um, you know, I think, maybe there's a bit of a walk before you run that, that needs to happen here. Um, there's got to be an easy way to, to be present right now. Um, 
you know, when there's someone in the neighborhood who needs help, the church isn't really a resource we go to, to be honest. Um, you know, on that day where it was 116, there was someone passed out in your side yard. And, you know, everyone on the street was bringing them waters and oranges and, hey, man, are you going, are you okay? And he clearly was not. But once you go around to the corner of the church, I'm sure there's someone there it was not an answer that any of us thought of. So for this to work, for any of these plans to work, you know, I think probably a first step has to be a, you know, a real commitment to accessibility for, um, you know, us being able to reach out and contact you and say, look, there's, there's someone who really needs help here. Um, Cause right now we, you know, we think of cheers, we think of the police, but you know, all we can do is leave a voicemail and, and send an email and get a response two weeks later. Yeah. I think again, a big piece of it with the um, extreme heat is that as the, church is unair conditioned and particularly during the pandemic it is unsafe for us to have staff even um, at the church but you're correct it is not a good place <laughs> in extreme heat for anyone human or animal um, at this point so thank you yeah I hear you and um, that was part of the appeal of um, I think like having like the short-term shelter or whatever is having like a flexible option and my hope is that like we would have a committee that is Agile <laughs> and can be that resource. So thank you. And sorry, friends, are you, um, do you live like next to the church? Yeah, I'm in the black house next to your parking lot. Okay. Um, but I was talking with Bob this morning. He's in the other house on the other side of like the playground. Yeah. And, and he was a volunteer for the, um, the daybreak shelter. And, you know, he would grab a sleeping bag and go sleep down there for a couple of nights that week and said everything was super efficient, very well managed. He knew who to talk to if there was an emergency. He knew what he was responsible for and what he wasn't. There was a lot of process and a very clear escalation path. And I think for any of these plans, that's what the neighborhood's going to be looking for. Because it's frankly, you know, kind of scary to, to put up a sign saying, please come here <laughs> when we're already dealing with folks who are coming here and, and are, are pretty lost, you know, pretty, pretty lost in their hearts. And we all have a lot of compassion for that. Friends, we sorry. also have families Friends. and kids and we're scared. I don't want to cut you off. I'm really sorry, but there's, there's no, a lot of folks who have questions. So yeah. if we could um, move on and then I make sure. Tom we'll had said he had a couple of questions. For a minute, if, that, if folks yeah. could do that. Um, yeah, I think Tom said a couple times he has, he has questions. Um, sure, Tom. Yeah, so um, Thomas Price here. So, you know, I, I do have concern and compassion for people. So don't get me wrong when I say this. I worked in mental health for five years. I've worked as a criminal defense attorney for 31 years. Um, I've worked with chronically mentally ill people, addicted people for all of my career. And it's challenging. And I think a lot of the people that you would be dealing with are marginal people with many difficulties. Oregon has one of the most broken mental health systems in the country and great and tremendous need for help with people. But you're dealing with uh, a problem that is pretty significant. I think that you know the concerns that I would have, I, I would have grave concerns about the tiny home village uh, proposal. I think that, uh, you know, a lot of members of the church, you know, live a little ways away or short distance away, but they don't live right across the street. I live right across the street. Um, you're going to have issues relevant to uh, people who have mental health problems, drug addiction problems. Uh, it may very well be uh, attractive to, uh, people who are looking for a place to come and decide maybe they want to just you know put a tent somewhere in in the yard uh, i just am concerned about the kind of issues that you're going to be potentially bringing here and the neighbors often are the front line of dealing with some of these things not not the church um and I, I think that I'm sympathetic to uh, the uh, emergency shelter if the weather is bad in the church itself, 
but the uh, logistics of dealing with a tiny home village, I think that would be tremendous. I've got a lot of concerns about whether or not that really works. Are you going to have uh, rapid COVID testing? You're going to have people who are make sure that folks who are there are vaccinated, um, not using drugs. Uh, you know, people that are going to be there long term, you're going to have to have drug testing. The Tom? kind of difficulties you're dealing with are significant. Yeah, Tom, I don't want to cut you off, um, but I want to make sure we get to everybody. Um, uh, yeah. So we are definitely taking notes on everything. <laughs> um, very quickly about the tiny home stuff. Um, they are very, very heavily regulated. Um, and Kieran pointed this out in the chat. Um, there's a lot of thought and organization that goes into them. Happy to write something up, um, but I wanna make sure we get to everybody. Um, Jennifer, Karen, who's the next I think Jennifer was up next. And okay. then we've got Kate who is excitingly a flying tortoise, I think, which I'm very excited to hear about as well. Thank you, hi. Uh, yeah, I'm also a neighbor. I live um, just south of the church. And we have also been feeling um, a pretty regular stream of houseless people and remaining pretty compassionate towards the situation. Um, but we are concerned about the danger for our family. Uh, the kids play up and down the street all the time. We let them outside, they meet their neighbors. If we have a situation up at the church, it could drastically change my lifestyle as a parent and the safety of the kids. Um, we did find a needle at the church and we emailed the church and called the church and it took about a month to get it removed. It was a hypodermic in the parking lot where the kids were playing. The communication hasn't been great, which leaves me really wary of a program as complicated as this arising. In addition, we recently had a home invasion where a man came into our home while we were putting the kids to bed and he was in my kitchen and he attacked my husband with swords and he did get cut, but he's okay. Um, he is a martial arts instructor and he's good at what he does. He was able to defend himself and get the guy out of the house with a cardboard tube. Um, there was a big question of whether to kill him or if he was in that kind of mortal danger. Bringing mental illness that is unregulated in any way that's not really, really supported. Um, it's so prevalent in the houseless community. That's what I love about Central City Concerns. They have these huge compounds where they have mental health care, they have everything they need to manage difficult cases which arise very often in this, this community as we all know. And, and um, I just, I would feel really nervous about anything other than a very robust system to deal with these these people and help them because if they're not helped in the way that they needed and managed in the way that they need, we're all going to pay the price for it. And we're always like, Mel had to take down her library, her neighborhood library, because the homeless population kept coming by and parking outside of it and trashing the street. They pull everything out, they leave trash all over the place, they were harassing our kids. So it's been rough. And I think the whole, my sense is that the people around me and me are nervous about that kind of extension of the church because historically we've had very poor response, even dealing with something as simple as a needle in the parking lot. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that, Kate. That sounds like an incredibly traumatic experience, that person breaking into your house. Um, I really, I hear you about the communication. That's gonna be, I'm already, I wrote it down. <laughs> Number one, we wanna make sure that that's the top of our list. So thank you, Kate. And, also, and I also want to say, like, we will continue to have community conversations going forward as this as this develops. Um, uh, so we have two people who raised hands. Jennifer would, has been waiting Jennifer, for a while. Well. Yeah, I want to make sure you get in. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, mm -hmm. I um, run the preschool at St. David's, and so I find myself usually being the person that opens the building in the morning and has to deal with things that are left over or people that are there. And um, I think I was also, we've been in the building for probably 17 or plus years and were there when Daybreak was there. And I think that was a really successful program that felt safe for us. 
It was contained. It was run by somebody other than St. David's volunteers, which I think they complemented the program lovely, but there was another organization that was doing that whole job. And then um, people would have dinner, stay there, and then be whisked away um, in the morning. And it just felt like very organized. I, I'm a little bit concerned about having anything extra that brings people, there are already people, and that brings people into the parking lot without um, safety measures, I guess, like what the neighbors are saying too, because um, if there's nobody there, then when I get there, I've got 15 minutes to get rid of everybody and clean up any drug paraphernalia and um, waste and stuff before I welcome all of the kids for emergency child care that we've been running all through COVID. So that's a little bit about what I'm a little bit worried about um, as far as having like more houses or, or something. But I like the idea of the church being a place that's, you know, a welcoming um, center or whatever, you know, when if it's too hot or too cold and we're closed, like that seems like a really appropriate use of a building. And so does having a, a space where people can go. And I mean, we'd like to partner with, with, with the church doing something, but I don't know, I'm a little bit of leery of leaving it up to volunteers to take care of um, the, you know, having extra guests, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds like protecting the, the grounds is yeah. something you need to work on. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, Jane has a comment and it says Ellen, but... Um, yeah, as before, before you speak up, um, I'm gonna, I'm just posting the link to, um, to the survey. Okay. So uh, that folks, if they have to run or, if, you know, they're gonna sit down in a few, um, I want everyone to um, be able to have access to that to share their, um, any comments or questions that they didn't get a chance to share. Oh, I accidentally sent it just to Carolyn. Okay, I'm gonna send it to everybody. Um, okay, Jane. Or, yeah. You Jane? Muted. You guys are muted still. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm Ross Roberts. I'm not Jane Heisler, but uh, James and Muriel here. We uh, live on the same block as the church, right across from Kate, right next to Franz. Can you guys hear us okay? A little broken up, but. Really breaking up. Can you hear us okay? I cannot. It is it is really rough sound. Sorry. Yeah, so sorry. We can't we can't understand mm -hmm. you. Um yeah. and I know we connected offline, so I'll I'll make sure that, that we have a we can comment that you want to put in the in the chat. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you said James was next. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought. Yeah. Um, Ellen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Duke. I'm actually uh, Ellen's husband, and I live directly south of the church. Uh, I'd like to maybe reiterate what some of the people on our street have. Stated, and that is, uh, I think we all, all wholeheartedly agree with the altruistic nature of what we're trying to do here. But our concerns, or mine anyway, have a lot to do with uh, the infrastructural availability of St. David's and how they can actually support the program that, that are being proposed in partnership with these people. As Kate stated, uh, if you're trying to get anything addressed physically. There's somebody who needs to mute. Hello. Getting a lot of static. Hello. Muted. Yeah. Jean, Jeannie? No. I just muted her. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. 
Am I, am I on? Yep, sorry, yep. Okay, thank you again. Again, uh, my concerns have to do with not the intent of the proposals, certainly not all of them anyway. Um, my concerns have to do with the infrastructural availability of the program administrators, as well as the staff of St. David's. Again, uh, trying to get anything addressed physically on site has been very, very difficult and slow in response. And, and I'm gonna be the guy that throws it out there. Uh, we, I personally don't feel like that St. David's has been a very responsive neighbor. And that probably has to do with the fact that it's a small congregation and resources are limited. So until those concerns can somehow be addressed or met with changes or growth of the uh, congregation or monetary needs are met, I, I don't know how this is gonna be executed in a very clean manner that doesn't effectively start changing the quality of our neighborhood. And I, I just, that's all I wanted to say. And again, it's, none of this is directed at the altruistic nature of what they're trying to do. Cause I, I wholeheartedly agree with the attempt. I, I, I understand and I'm not completely unsympathetic of what our community is facing, not only our neighborhood at large, but our homeless community, you know, everyone needs a place to live. Everyone needs a safe place to stay. And I'm 100% on board with that. But we all have to deliver that in a way that doesn't start negatively affecting the neighborhood. And that's my concern. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. That feedback is, is really helpful. Just about folks' experiences. Yeah. Cass, I do have something I'd like to say in, in turn. Uh-huh. Are you ready for me? Yes. Okay. I'm Jeannie Beal. Um, I've been at St. David's for a number of years now moved from North Carolina. Um, and I live a block, a, 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 about a block away from a church in my own community. And I would have concerns. However, I really, I've worked in the area of low income housing professionally. I really would like for St. David's to do something. I think the tiny homes, we are nowhere near ready to do. Um, I think we have a very commit, in fact, you all know as St. Mark's members that you all are extended family to me. Um, uh, I think we have a committed group of um, volunteers at age 74. I can't uh, do the things that I could have done 20 or 30 years ago, but I can do some things. And um, I, um, I, I, I would love to have neighbors who would help with uh, some of the other options. I, as I said, I think option number four is way out of our league, but um, I think some of the other options are very doable. And, um, and I'm committed as a member to being very empathetic and to neighbors and working completely with neighbors. But um, I am also very committed to doing something that is a tangible way to help Portland's overwhelming number of homeless people and to do it at the scale that is appropriate for St. David's. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, I know we're a little bit over, but um, uh, I would like to give Jane the chance to speak if that's all right, Kerlin, or should we wrap up? We, uh, I, I would be happy to. Go ahead, oh. I'm Ross. Hi there. Um, I'm Ross. I am uh, married to Jane. We live in the house directly across from the parking lot. So as I turn my head, I see completely to the back of the parking lot and everything in it. Um, our view would be substantially altered with eight or 10 or 15 or 20 tiny homes. Um, and I think that. You know, I, this has been very good to hear from a lot of the folks who have had very direct experience in working with these various populations. Um, I'm an, uh, retired now, but was an urban planner. And one of the things that, that sort of pops into my mind is, well, if you fill your parking lot with uh, tiny homes, then there are no place for anyone to park. Therefore, those, those, uh, those, 
cars park on the street. And if you've noticed, we have a big old house going in right next to us. The neighborhood is filling up uh, with people who own homes um, and people who are invested in trying to keep uh, this a, a nice place to live. And the other options, you know, aside from the tiny house village, um, not knowing as much as you all do about the, the difficulties and challenges in serving various populations um, with substance abuse and other things, the use being contained within the building and tightly managed by the church seems to be something that would be, um, at least for, from our perspective, much preferable to uh, creation of, of, of a tiny home village. I really don't think that, um, I think that it's one of those things where once, it, once it's there, my, my bet would be um, that it's there permanently. Um, not a temporary use, but um, for years. So that's just it. Um, and I think I've echoed some of the sentiments of, of the other folks living around here, but just to reemphasize, we've been here over 30 years um, and see the church every day. It's been, been a, generally a pretty good neighbor, um, but there have been occasions in the past where there have been events at the church, where there have been like the uh, village building conversions, which filled the parking lot with all sorts of booths and a fair and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, th these things spilled out into the neighborhood and, um, and were definitely uh, something that the neighbors had to deal with and not the church. And I guess just finally, I would, I would applaud you for trying to make a dent in this awful um, homeless epidemic that we're all living through. Um, but I think it would be important and, and a, a real measure of the success of the program if you could do it in such a way that it, it does have minimal impacts um, on on the neighbors who are here looking at mm -hmm. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Eric Flubo 8, is there anyone who would like yeah, I think we should, I would like to go ahead and um, wrap up. We do have, um, I, I feel like this has been, um, I'm, Cass, I'm so grateful for you putting together the presentation and the shelter committee for looking at um, different possibilities. Um, I'm really grateful to all of our neighbors um, who have come to hear. Again, I think the, um, and as, as Cindy just posted, none of these are things that we have committed to yet. Um, and so I feel a little bit sad that I don't think we got a chance to really um, discuss um, in some ways the possibilities of what some of those other options were. Um, and so I think there is obviously so much more conversation to happen. Um, did everybody get a chance to get the link to this survey where we are going to be doing some more um, intentional listening um, and things. And so I just want to reassure the neighbors, we are not start, like none of these are things that we have started yet. This is the time of questions. This is us um, listening and being curious, um, again, to wanting to be good neighbors to all of our neighbors, um, those in million dollar houses and those on the streets, um, that as a Christian community, um, both um, all of these people that are around us that are within um, the purview of our sweet church are our neighbors. And um, yeah, I feel like there is still so much to be discussed. I just would like to reassure everybody, you will not wake up tomorrow morning to find tiny homes in the parking lot. That is not um, what Cass said. <laughs> that is not what we have said we are going to do. It is a thing that one of the reasons that we discussed it is it has come up over and over and over again at the congregational level. People have asked, with all of the space that we have at our building, with all of the space that we have on our grounds, could we do tiny homes? So this is an answer to questions that have been raised by the congregation, not a thing that we are committed to starting right now. Um, so if you would please fill out the survey if you have other um, neighbor organizations that you would like to forward it to. Um, once we have good emails for 
um, various neighbors and we can move forward in this conversation. Um, I would love to keep this going. Um, I am really taking to heart and as the rector, I would like to apologize um, for what I am hearing about inadequate response to your concern. Um, I am really upset um, that that has been so many folks experience um, and I would like to apologize. Um, the, this, I think everybody knows that the past 18 months in particular have been incredibly challenging um, for so many of us. And I apologize um, if anybody has had um, a rough experience with, with the church in terms of our um, response to your concerns. So um, thank you. I am grateful that even if you have had tricky times in the past, thank you for showing up and continuing to be in conversation with us. Um, yeah. Um, Cass, is there anything else that you would like to say to close us? Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming and um, sharing your, your thoughts. Um, it's reflected in the chat and I agree that um, tiny homes kind of took up a lot of, of space and uh, I'll take on that um, responsibility. <laughs> um, I also think I could have shared more information about how they work, but that's another um, that's another conversation. But I'm very, very, very grateful to the neighbors for coming and sharing their experiences and um, what they think would work and wouldn't work and for the congregation coming and listening to me talk for 45 minutes. You're very kind. <laughs> um, again, this is just the beginning. So um, we, will, we will continue working on this. So thank you everyone um, and have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Cass and Carolyn. Oh, and I guess as if folks are leaving, I'll just say like the, in the survey, there's, a, there's an option to share your contact information and I'll reach out, you know, via email with a follow-up just so everyone should give me your email address. So I don't know if you want me to have that power to have your email address, but I'll try to use it wisely. Thank you for putting all this information together and setting up the meeting. We appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, thank you.